Well, grace and peace, beloved, from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So who or what do you belong to? What membership requirements, fees, or sign pledges are essential for you to belong? Well, what level of membership are you? Platinum, silver, gold? Well, some Galatians were trying to force the Gentiles to live as Jews. Once again, that freedom that was bestowed by the Holy Spirit is shackled by following the law. There was a pecking order in this Galatian Christian community. The Christian Jews held that the Gentiles who didn't follow the Torah were inferior. That tug of the law and tradition is so strong. Well, not that the law wasn't or isn't important. The law was given to guide and protect people from harm. It creates these important boundaries. But by following it, it will not make God love you because God already loves you. The law is to show your weakness and your need for God. It's to, the law is there to drive you to Christ and to receive God's mercy. Well, the problem was with then when people started treating the law as an end to itself. Obeying the law became the be-all and end-all, losing the purpose of what the law was supposed to do, living a life of faith and trust in God. Well, that is what Paul is chastising the Galatians communities about, focusing on following the rules as a way to eternal life instead of living a life of faith based on Jesus Christ. Well, some of the people were bound to the good old days. They fell back into what was comfortable and familiar. That flesh that Paul is talking about is the old age, that time before the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that time of separation, of distinctions, when works of the law were your daily driving force. Well, Paul himself knew that seduction of the law. He claimed that he was a perfect law-abiding Pharisee that is about as perfect as you can be by following a law. But such strict observance of the law did not create peace within him but it only bred hate and violence against those that opposed him and his extremism. Paul used to focus on keeping the law until, until his unexpected encounter of God's love and grace that transformed him. Well, God's grace is hard to accept. We're so used to Going, uh, going our own way, pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. We can do it ourselves. Well, we work hard to meet the expectations of our parents, our teachers, our employers, our friends and spouses. We congratulate ourselves for jobs well done, for what we've accumulated, what we've accomplished. We're not used to or even want to accept gifts that we didn't earn or deserve. Well, that's why the Galatians and us today have a hard time with grace, that free gift from God. Richard Rohr's meditation in Economy of Grace describes God's grace as a humiliation to the ego because the free gifts say nothing about being strong, superior, or moral. The ego does not know how to receive things freely or without logic. It likes to be worthy and needs to understand in order to accept things as true. Well, Paul tells us 
that the old way of divisions, the old way of trying to be perfect, the old way of trying to make God love us is gone. There is a new age now, a new thing that God is doing. Well, that new age is the activity of the Holy Spirit after Jesus' resurrection. Paul reminds the Galatians that the Spirit had performed miracles and works of wonders among them because they had received and believed the message of Jesus Christ crucified and risen and they had put their faith and trust in this message and in Jesus. That Spirit's work among them was proof of Jesus' risen life. Well, this new age is the beginning of the end times. Christ is risen first, that first fruits of the new age were with his believers to follow. And another marker of this new age is when the Gentiles will know that the God of Israel is the God of all, not just some, not just those who follow the law, not just those who are descendants of Abraham, but Lord of all. Well, from the beginning, God has called people his own by their faith in the Lord. Well, it started with Abraham, Israel's father of faith. Genesis 15, 6 states, And he, Abraham, believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned to him as righteousness. Well, being made right with God was a gift, and it was separate from the law. But even before that, even before Abraham's rightness with God, there was a blessing to the Gentiles. Genesis 12, 3 proclaims, I will bless you, those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All these very people that Paul had preached to about Christ are the ones that God had planned to bless all along. Well, just as the story of Abraham and Sarah is a story of grace, a family made right with God, not because they were special, but because God made between them and him a right relationship, we too are made right with God through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. As Paul tells the Galatians, you are all children of God through faith. All of you are one in Christ Jesus. You know, we like to self-define ourselves in many ways. We're Americans, we're Lutheran, we're a child, a parent, a spouse, single friend, employer, employee. Well, the list goes on and on. But four times in this short passage, Paul claims no longer. No longer are we to be defined by nationality or race. No longer are we to be divided by income or assets. No longer are we to be separated by gender or sexuality. We are all one in Christ. Well, last week at the Festival of Homiletics in San Antonio, this was played out on our multiple daily worship services. There were denominations across the United States, Canada, and Great Britain attending this event. Well, there were different theological views, different genders, different place, and race, but none of that separated us in worshiping Christ. We did not let the old labels define us. We were all united in our worship of the living Lord. Well, Paul proclaims to us now that we have new labels to define us. Child of God, belong to Christ, blessed, heirs of the promise. 
worshiping and serving together reminds us that we are Christ's family. We come as children of the promise through these invisible means of grace, through our faith and the filling of the Holy Spirit. So that all those visible distinctions of race, economic and social positions, and gender are swept away by the winds of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaking the truth through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We all come from different places, different experiences, and differing sureness of faith. But like that baptismal gown that's worn and passed down through the generations, all of us are wearing that same gown, but we're all different people united in Christ. All have been bound together in God's free gift of salvation. All are united in our identity and our destiny in Jesus. So what do we make of this expansive and inclusive club called Christianity? Christ's ascension marks the end of one age and the beginning of another. Being set free from all of our boundaries and burdens by trying from, by our own efforts to make ourselves right with God, we are freed to come together to serve our neighbor. We do that by building houses and feeding the hungry and caring for the homeless and telling about God's free gift of grace and welcome. We come with open hearts and minds amazed at whom God has called into God's family. Well, through God's presence, we don't emphasize our differences, but our unity is God's beloved children working together to show the world God's love and grace in action. Well, through our encounter with the God of love and grace, shown in the waters of baptism and the bread and wine, we too can be transformed like Paul into the beloved child of God that we already are. Well, thanks be to God. Amen.